Good morning again. Let me invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 14, 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're in the middle of a series right now called Anticipating God. Uh, We're going to be spending a few weeks looking at some Old Testament passages that describe the greatness and power of God displayed towards His people. We will be enjoying then a couple of messages on the Christmas story, and then we are looking forward as we turn into the new year to launch a series in the book of Mark. So that's our preaching plan, but for this morning we are looking at 1 Samuel chapter 14. I'm not quite sure where 1 Samuel is, it's, it's towards the beginning. You have Genesis through Deuteronomy, which leaves people in the, God's people are in the desert, and then Joshua, where they come into the promised land, Judges, where they mess everything up, and then 1 Samuel, where God begins to prepare them for His King. Octavius Winslow, Christian author, said, when the believer opens the Bible, it is with the profound and solemn conviction that he is about to listen to the voice of God. That's what we do when we open this Bible. We are about to listen to God's voice. And as we look at this passage and other passages like this, I want us to have a a sense of anticipating God, because that's the goal of preaching through these passages. Uh, This last spring, I had the joy of taking my family for just a brief time to the beach, and one of my highlights from that time was, was my little son's um, introduction to waves. Uh, so the way he liked to do the waves was to stand there and have, have me stand with my back to the wave, holding him or holding on to him, and waiting for the next wave to strike us. And then when it would, he would laugh with the joy and exhilaration, and then we would wait again for it to strike us again. And you were able to see something that is actually remarkable and profound through the eyes of a child. That's what I hope this series and this passage does this morning. I hope it builds that sense of anticipation and faith and belief in something powerful but good. Obviously, the older we get, the deeper we get into the waters of God's greatness and power, so the waves become more and more striking to us, but yet they are still good. They're still reason for exhilaration. They are powerful and good, and I pray that we will have that childlike anticipation of the power of God on display whenever we gather, whenever we meet with Him in private. We want to anticipate God. We want to live anticipating Him, and that's the goal of letting the voice of God speak to us on Sunday mornings as well. We do not do sermons based on my opinion we encounter God through His Word. So let's begin reading. This, this story breaks into three sections. I'll read them one at a time, and we'll comment on them, and then we'll apply that to our situation today. So 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. We'll read the first section, first five verses to start. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come. Let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gebeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other was Sina. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. I might caption this opening paragraph, The Camp of Foreboding. The camp of foreboding. It starts uh, well enough. Jonathan, the son of the Israelite king Saul, uh, says to the young man, let's, let's go over to the camp of our enemies, perhaps to scout them out. We don't know what his intentions are, but it certainly is a courageous beginning. 
But at that point, the paragraph goes downhill. Saul, his father, in just the chapter previously, had been informed by Samuel the prophet that because of his disobedience to God, his kingship would not endure, that God was looking for a king after his own heart. And actually, 1 Samuel focuses on this idea of the need of a good king, the need of a faith-filled king. That's one of the major themes of this book. And Saul has proven to not be that individual. So much of the remainder of the book is Saul set in contrast to the good king that God's people need. And so when we come to chapter 14, where they have been facing this Philistine horde coming to attack them, it's not good news that Saul is staying there in the pomegranate cave, or might be under a pomegranate tree, gathering his officials, because Saul has already been announced as unfaithful. God is not going to be with him in the same way that he was. And so this is a sense of foreboding, a minor tone, uh, enters the paragraph, enters the camp. Not only that, but the writer seems to make this abundantly clear by issuing a somewhat uh, strange family tree. Did you notice that? For some strange reason, he feels the need not only to reference the priest, Ahijah, that is with Saul, but his ancestry. He's the son of Ahitab. Ichabod is his uncle, apparently, who was the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli. Now, for anybody who's been reading this book, this is not a good family tree to have around because Phinehas was a wicked priest. He had sinned literally on the grounds of the temple itself in immorality. He had manipulated God's people. He had despised the word of the Lord, and he had been killed in battle under God's judgment. Eli, the priest, had been rebuked by God for failing to restrain his son and had been told his priestly line would not continue. So, so far in this camp, we have a king who's just been told his kingly line will not continue. We have a priestly line who's been told the priestly line will not continue, and this is their war cabinet. It's a camp of foreboding. It starts on a major note with Jonathan saying, let's go over to the Philistines, and then you begin thinking about the people that are in this war cabinet, all of whom have been rejected by God and ultimately, at one time or another, are going to be judged. And then you have this, this interesting description of the geography that seems to make a point. There's a rocky crag on one side, there's a rocky crag on the other. It, it's, it's almost as though the writer is depicting the reality of Israelite situation. I mean, if there's ever been a, a, a people between a rock and a hard place, uh, this was it. They are literally between a rock and a hard place, the crags rise above them, their king has been rejected, their priestly line under Eli has been rejected, and so this camp is not looking good. And not only that, you notice the counting of their army is to 600. You notice that phrase, there were 600 people with him. We've already been informed that the Philistine army has 6,000. This is, a, this is a, a, a terrible moment for the camp of Israel. Nothing looks good. God is not likely to be with this king or this priest. Their men are outnumbered. They're between a rock and a hard place. And the king that they wanted to go before them to fight their battles is, in one sense, he seems to be almost cowering in this passage. The camp of foreboding. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hand and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. 
Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. I might caption this paragraph, the champion of faith. The champion of faith. It's important to understand that Jonathan's plan is ridiculous from a military point of view. First of all, he's taking one backup guy. He's not bringing his whole army, and then he's going to show himself to the enemy. Tom, the uh, commentator Robert Bergen Uh, describes some of the lunacy that's going on here. Jonathan's plan, he says, for fighting the Philistines defied all military logic. First, he would give up the element of surprise. Second, he would avoid a skirmish with the Philistines if they abandoned their position of strategic superiority on the hilltop and exhausted themselves coming down to his position. In that case, he would not attack. On the other hand, he would attack if they challenged him to scale the sheer rock wall and then take them on. The plan is so absurd that if it did succeed, it could only be because the Lord has given them into our hands. The point of this story is definitely not that God's people should come up with surprise attacks on the enemy. That that, that is not the point of the story. The point of the story is contained essentially in what Jonathan says to his armor bearer, it may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Apparently, Jonathan has had enough of the camp of foreboding. He doesn't even indicate what he's doing to his father. We have a good indication from the rest of the story that Saul would have forbidden him from doing this. Saul was not in a place of trust in the Lord at this point in his life. So Jonathan decides he's just going to strike out in faith on his own, climb up this (laughs) rocky crag, and when he finally gets to the top, he's convinced the Lord will give this garrison into his hands. And wouldn't you think that every Israelite child through the generations would love to be the armor bearer who can say, Behold, do all that is in your heart. I am with you, heart and soul. This is the kind of stuff heroes are made of. He goes out intentionally wanting the Lord to reveal his own purposes. Now, this is not some directions for how to find the will of God. It's not like, you know, this isn't a recommendation. Call up that company. If they say, uh, we would love to have you, then you shouldn't work there. If you say, we wouldn't love to have you, you should keep calling them because that's where you're supposed to work. This isn't directions for how to find God's will. This is just a story. We're supposed to get the main point out of it. But for Jonathan, this was the way that God was going to reveal his intention to give him a victory. He says, look, if they call us up there, we're going. We're going because the Lord has given them, he says, into our hands. That's exactly what happens. So somehow they they climb this hill on their hands and feet. So you get the sense that they're having to rock climb up a hill. Somehow when they get to the top, they're immediately able to assault this garrison such that the odds are reversed. Did you notice that? These two conquer 20. Suddenly, not only have they won this initial strike, but the unthinkable happens. The garrison of the Philistines immediately begins to tremble with fear. Probably what's going on here is that they interpreted this impossible attack as an omen. Again, the commentator Robert Bergen says that this is likely what took place. They likely assumed this was an omen that their gods were not with them that day. And they would have been confirmed when even the earth begins to tremble. Imagine the the sense of this for a a superstitious, religious kind of Philistine warrior. Their 6,000-man army has just been assaulted by two guys clambering up a hillside. The two guys somehow take out 20 of their advanced warriors... And the panic begins to ensue in the whole army. They're not sure what's happening. And then an earthquake starts. They would assume the gods are not with us today. And they would be right. They would be right. 
The champion of faith is Jonathan in this story. He declares from the outset that numbers and size don't matter to God whatsoever. whatsoever. A, an inconvenient position, a lack of strategic uh, possibilities, the, the loss of surprise is irrelevant when it comes to the Lord. Jonathan doesn't care about the size of the army. He doesn't care about the size of their enemy. He doesn't care about the, the height of the hillside. He doesn't care about any kind of military logic whatsoever. All he cares about is, is the Lord in this battle? Because if he is, we can't lose, and if he isn't, we can't win. The champion of faith. But the battle is not over. Let's keep reading in verse 16. The watchman of Saul in Gebeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priests, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priests, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into battle. And behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel, listen to this, who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. And the most obvious conclusion in the world. So, the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth Avon. Let's think about what happens here. We, we don't get a decisive picture of Saul in this battle. We're not sure whether it was good for him to consult the Lord at that moment or obviously a dumb thing to do since God was already obviously going before them in this battle. It's not plain, I don't think, whether this was right or wrong. What is very plain is that Saul doesn't know what's going on. His watchmen come back and report. This would have been some kind of advanced scout they come back and support something, <laughs> report something very strange. Um, so the, the enemy is, is running away. And we're not sure why. <laughs> we're not sure why they're running away because they're outnumbering us. They have all of the advanced weaponry. You find out earlier in the chapter that Israel didn't even have uh, metal weapons. So they're basically pre-Bronze Age and the Philistines are post-Bronze Age. They didn't even allow uh, metal workers to be in Israel. So the only two guys with swords in the whole Israelite army are Saul and Jonathan. Nobody else even has a sword. So this, <laughs> this army of farmers with their plow tools is out facing a sophisticated army with metal weapons. And for some reason, the scouts report, the enemy is fleeing. They're running away. We don't know why. So Saul assumes, well, well, somebody must have attacked him. Who's gone? And they find out, well, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer. And then he thinks, well, we should probably ask God what to do, I guess. So he calls Ahijah, and he asks him to start inquiring, presumably, of the Lord. But then the Philistines are getting louder and louder. So then he thinks, well, I don't, I, I, we should go attack, I guess. And then you find out, as they observe the battle, the Philistines are fighting each other. This huge army is now attacking each other, and not only that, apparently there was these turncoat Hebrews who had given up on God's army and were sticking with the Philistines, but when they realize the route that's about to take place, they come bustling back into the Israelite camp, hey guys, we'd like to fight with you today, actually. Not only that, but it says, I love this phrase, there were those that were hiding in the hill country of Ephraim, and when they hear that the Philistines are fleeing, they come out of hiding and start. You imagine you start the report goes out from cave to cave. Hey guys, they're running away. We should get in on this. There's going to be some loot. Uh, they're leaving their bags behind them. We should run and get in on this battle. So you have cowards and turncoats who are now chasing after the fleeing army of Philistines who are fighting each other. Listen. The point of this is, this is absurd. This is insane. This sophisticated, well-armed army 
is fighting each other. Their own insiders, their traitors, are turning against them now. Even people who are afraid of everything are coming out of their caves to come fight them as well. And so the result of all of this human absurdity is revealed in verse 23. The Lord saved Israel that day. In spite of this foolish and rebellious king, in spite of this rejected priestly line, the Lord saved Israel. In spite of their being outnumbered, the Lord saved them. In spite of the fact they had to climb up the hillside to even get to the army, the Lord saved them. In spite of the fact that their own people had betrayed them and were fighting for their enemies, the Lord saved them. In spite of the fact that the rest of Israel was hiding in caves, the Lord saved them. The Lord saved them not because of them, but in spite of them. Not because of their power and their strength and their might and their strategy. Saul doesn't even know what's happening. The point of the story is Saul has no idea what's going on. They didn't even know Jonathan left, and the battle is already being won. What's the point of this whole story? Believe in the unlimited power of God's unstoppable salvation. Believe in the unlimited power. Notice what Jonathan says. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, by many or by few. (laughs) Nothing. Numbers are irrelevant. Nothing can hinder the Lord. Believe in the unlimited power of God's unstoppable salvation, the unlimited power. Listen, if you're an Israelite man or woman in this moment, you are exceedingly vulnerable. You've been following the wrong master, your priestly line has failed you, and your numbers are insufficient, and there is no chance of avoiding slavery or death except that the Lord is your shield and your defender. So for Israelites who read this over the centuries, the point was clear. Look, you may seem small and insignificant and worthless and even under the appropriate discipline of the Lord, but you can believe in the unlimited power of your God to save you. Unlimited power, not limited by anything you can see. Because if this battle could be won with two guys going up a hillside and attacking a garrison and an earthquake, then there is no point in the history of God's people where their need for God is greater than God's power to save and rescue them. Believe in the unlimited power of God's unstoppable salvation. Now, how, how are we to apply this today? The calling of Israel to be a a physical governmental nation that fought physical battles was a temporary provision of God. It was not permanent. It was temporary. Jesus makes that very clear when he says in the New Testament, my kingdom is not of this world. So this was a temporary moment. So how are we supposed to get something from this battle victory where Jonathan's climbing up a hill and literally swinging a sword at his enemies? Obviously, we are not supposed to do that today. This is not justification for some some kind of physical advance of God's people. No. We have to read this in terms of where it is in the storyline of the Bible. Anytime we read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is not primarily about hero stories. It's primarily about God's story towards his people. So how are we to read this? Well, we read it, first of all, in terms of the book. What's happening in 1 Samuel at this point? The big, the big question in 1 Samuel at this moment is, who is going to be the king to lead God's people? Saul has already been rejected. He's going to be rejected again in the next chapter. And in between those two words of rejection, there's this story about Jonathan. So you get the sense that Saul's own son is a foil, a contrast with who Saul is. The writer of Samuel intentionally puts these stories this way to reveal, look, Jonathan is the kind of king that Israel needs. Jonathan is the kind of champion of faith that Israel needs. I don't think we're supposed to primarily identify with Jonathan in this story. We're primarily supposed to identify with the people who are vulnerable and in need of a faith-filled leader. Now, can we learn something from Jonathan and should we follow in his footsteps? Yes, but primarily what's coming to view here is this is the kind of king that Israel really needs. 
And for readers of 1 Samuel, they would think this is the kind of king that eventually they're going to receive in David. This is the kind of king that eventually God gave us after Saul was finally killed. But it's also true for the readers, the Israelite readers over the centuries of this book, there would be a note of sadness in this story. Because this champion of faith, in just a few chapters, is going to be dead on a hillside close by his father, who is also dead. There's a note of sadness. And even the king who was to come, David, though he was victorious for a while, he wasn't perfect. And his kingdom after him began to decline. There would be a a note of sadness even as you read this story of victory. There would be a a note of unfulfillment. There would be in some ways a sense of, yes, this is, this is the king we need. This is, this is the champion of faith that we need. But, but, but Jonathan couldn't ultimately be that champion. He had a, he had a high moment right here. But, but then even Jonathan would, would suffer under the condemnation against his father. And, and even David, the, the king that Jonathan kind of anticipates here, even he ultimately ultimately declined, and his, his son declined even faster, and his son after him declined even faster, and, and the kingdom went down. There was, there was no great champion of faith that could carry God's people up the hill and conquer for them in the name of the Lord. So the, the Old Testament stories like this, they, they leave you with a taste of what could be, but with a sense of it not being yet. have somebody like Jonathan that would climb a hill, conquer the enemy, trust God, reject all military and human wisdom, and and be revealed on top of that hill as the the spear point of God's decisive victory, protecting his people and vindicating his glory. Wouldn't Wouldn't it be great to have someone like that? And when you get to the New Testament... The major point that many of the New Testament writers make is that that person has come. That person has come. The the king that they desperately needed through the downward spiral of judges and that they looked for in, in Saul and then in Jonathan and then in David and then in Solomon over the pages of the history of God's people. And no one quite rose to the occasion, but they still wanted him to come. That king has finally come. So when Jesus marched into Jerusalem and those little children were crying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. They were declaring the king that we've been waiting for, the champion of faith that we've been waiting for, who would bring about the victory of the Lord, the ultimate victory of the Lord. That champion has come. That champion has come. That's why Paul begins his letter to the Romans saying, this is the gospel about Jesus Christ, who was descended from David in the flesh. It's why Matthew begins his gospel saying, he is the son of David It's not just interesting genealogical background. It's saying something theological. This is the champion we've been waiting for. This is the champion that Jonathan looked like but couldn't ultimately be. And David looked like but couldn't ultimately be. This is the champion that looked nothing like Saul. This is the champion we've been waiting for. He has finally come. And so we read stories like this. Our first application is not go out there and be like Jonathan and clamber up your own hill on your hands and knees and fight the enemy with your own swords. No, the story is look to the champion of faith that God has provided. And we have hills to climb, but we do it in response to his victory. We're more like the soldiers who are advancing in his victory already won. We're more like those soldiers. We're more like that armor bearer who says, do all that you wish, I am with you, heart and soul. We're not the hero of the story but we do get to follow in the hero's victory. So if we were going to turn this into a New Testament application, it would be believe in the unlimited power of God's salvation revealed in Jesus Christ. Believe in the unlimited power of God's salvation revealed in Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate champion of faith. Now how do we do that? What does that belief look like? What does it look like in our our day-to-day lives? 
Well, it begins by rejecting trust in our own strength. Rejecting trust in our own strength. Listen, this is the logic of the gospel. Jesus Christ, when he suffered and died on the cross, contrary to all human wisdom, that was the victory over the enemies of God and the salvation of his people. To be people of Christ is to be people who reject the wisdom of this world, who assume that numbers equal strength, that physical strength equals strength, that human wisdom equals strength, that human intelligence equals strength. The gospel logic says God was able to save humanity through the weakness of a champion dying on a cross, just like God was able to save Israel that day through the weakness of a man climbing up a hill and conquering his enemies without any knowledge of any of the people he was saving. If we apply that to our own lives, it certainly means we must not, as people of Christ, the Christ who died on the cross, we must not be people who boast in or are despairing because of our lack of strength. You know what? Our own story of salvation is told in these pages. Our camp, you know what our camp was? It was the camp of judgment and foreboding. That's what our camp was like. We, we would have been a, 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 an appropriate member in that war council, clueless and rejected. Hopeless and helpless, cowering and fearful. That's who we were. All the trappings, maybe, of religion and physical prestige, but none of the hope that is actually necessary. That's who we were when God saved us. God rescued that camp with all of their insufficiency and sense of foreboding, and God saved us out of our camp of rejection as well based on his own initiative without any knowledge on our part whatsoever. So when we look at our own weaknesses today, our own sense of vulnerability today, where are you weak and vulnerable today? Are you tempted to define God's ability to rescue and save you according to your own weakness, your own ability? What about God's ability to save someone else? Do you see someone who looks like a hopeless case? Listen, we... We are of the religion of the champion who climbed the hill. That means that there is no camp unsavable. There is no people beyond the power of his salvation. He can make even enemies fight each other to rescue his people. He can certainly rescue anyone, and no one is beyond the reach of his unstoppable salvation. So listen, to, to be anticipating God, the God that is described in the pages of Scripture, we must first reject any trust in our own resources. If you measure what God can do by your own resources, you are betraying the wisdom of the cross. If you measure what God can do by your own resources, you are betraying the wisdom of the cross. The wisdom of the cross says strength through weakness. Listen, that's true for mothers caring for your children, if you measure what God can do based on your own resources, you are betraying, you are setting aside the wisdom of the cross. It, it's true of fathers who are attempting to grow and discipling their children. If you measure what God can do based on your own resources, you are turning away from the wisdom of the cross. You are the people of the cross. That is power through weakness. That is power in weakness. That is power following the crucified and risen Savior. We reject measuring what God can do based on our own resources. That's the first way we cultivate this kind of faith and the unlimited power of God's unstoppable salvation. Second thing we can do, we rejoice in Christ as the champion of our salvation. Listen, the, the Christian never does first and meditates later. The Christian meditates first, and then out of that meditation, then he does. D don't first go charging away from a passage like this thinking, how can I have faith? Go charging out saying, how can I know more about the champion of my faith? We're, we're good Western Americans. We like to do. But sometimes we just need to look. We need to look at Jesus. And we can even see Jesus even in the imagery of this passage. 
Jesus didn't climb the hill that he climbed even with a single companion. He had nobody with him saying, I am with you heart and soul. He had people saying, I don't know the man. And he climbed that hill and his hands and feet were pierced because he went not to kill but to be killed. Jonathan went to that hill knowing, or at least believing, that God would give him immediate physical victory over his enemies. Jesus went to his hill knowing that his enemies would achieve a kind of temporary victory over him so that he could achieve ultimate victory over them. Jonathan went to conquer. Jesus went to first suffer so that he could conquer. Jesus climbed the hill of Calvary and climbed onto the cross and laid himself down and exposed himself to the mockery and derision of his enemies, discounting who he was. They indeed showed him a thing so that he could rescue us, so that he could save us so that he could be the champion of our faith, the one who in himself saved God's people. In Christ, the champion and the Lord who saves are one and the same. The Lord sends himself to the hill of difficulty to rescue his people. He climbs himself up to the cross to rescue his people, to save the camp of foreboding and doom, and to bring them into victory. He himself is the champion of our faith, the champion of our souls, the one who died in our place, the one who conquered kingdoms the kingdom of darkness that had us in prison. He's the one who broke the bars of our chains, who conquered the enemies, who held us in their grip. He's the one who rejected our former master so that we could be set free from his enslaving rule. Listen, when Jesus climbed that hill, every step should be precious to us. Every word. If, if you can imagine Israelite children over the ages pouring over every word. And then what did he say? He said nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. As Christians, we should know every word. Every word. As Jesus climbs up that hill to face our enemies alone, to conquer them in our place. Rejoice in the champion of our salvation. Brothers and sisters, how much time are you spending studying the champion of our faith? Let, let me be very direct. In your private devotional lives, are you thinking about, explicitly thinking about Jesus Christ dying to save us? I'm not just talking about general Bible reading or general prayer or general reading of Christian material. I'm talking specifically about Jesus' death in our place. Are, are you studying that? Uh, many, many wonderful verses to study in the Bible. Are you prioritizing those verses that explicitly celebrate the champion of our faith conquering the enemy of our souls and our own condemnation? Are, are, you, are you prioritizing that? Let me encourage you, look for that. Look for those verses that celebrate that. Go to Isaiah 53 and, and watch him climb that hill. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. He was bruised in our place. He suffered for our iniquities. Go there. Go to, go to Psalm 22 and look at that description of the suffering servant who cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Go to the end of the Gospels and study the steps of Jesus Christ as he walks up that hill. Study the Savior. He is the champion of our faith. Our faith flows from gazing at him. You can't manufacture your own faith in God for your own smaller hills of difficulty. It flows from gazing at Him, walking with Him up that hill, considering His cries from that cross, considering His battle cry of victory when He rose from the tomb. Study those sections of Scripture and let the faith and affection flow out of your heart. 
Are you facing relational difficulties right now, work difficulties, uncertainties with your children, uncertainties about your finances? You know, the best advice I can give you, study the champion of the faith as he rose up the hill called Calvary and died in your place, and you will find peace and rest and joy and faith welling up in your soul. The best Bible study for any need is the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many other great Bible studies, but that's the best one. That's the foundational one. That's the one where we see the champion of our faith and we remember the size of our God. Reject trusting in your own resources. Rejoice in Christ as the champion of our salvation. And finally, advance in his victory. Advance in his victory. Like this army of Israel, like this armor bearer that I cannot wait to meet when I get to heaven, the people of God advance in God's victory. You get the sense that what they have to do is, is it, it's not irrelevant to them, but it is irrelevant to the victory. You see the difference? Even the cowards, even the traitors, they want to get in on this advance, but the victory is going to happen not because of their strength, but because God and his champion has always brought, already brought it about. The same is true for the Christian life. Look, you, you can choose to stay out of the battle, but why wouldn't you want to get in on this? Why wouldn't you want to get in on this route? Why wouldn't you want to get in on advancing the kingdom? We do that through evangelism. We do that through building up God's people. We do that through service, through serving, through love, through worship. We do that through just being the church in the world. And when we gather, you don't want to stay on the sidelines while God's kingdom is unstoppably advancing in the glory of his king. Listen, wherever you are, there is hope for you in this passage. Listen, if, if you're a Christian in name only and you've been hiding in a cave somewhere up in Ephraim, afraid of getting involved in the battle, look, those guys got to join in. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe you've been clothing yourself like a Philistine and you've been joining the army of this world and indulging in the lusts of the flesh and, and pressing forward the kingdom of darkness in your practical life. You know what the good news is? This army invites you to come back and repent and join it in the victory of this great champion. Even the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines rallied and came with them. The same is true for those who know what they should be doing but are not doing it right now. Listen, come back to the army of the king. Serve him, witness for him, humble yourself before him, reject the lies of this world, reject the, the enslavement that comes from working for the powers of this age. Or if you've been fearful and thinking, you know, I'm just going to stay out of this fight. There's a lot of, of, of cultural antagonism towards Christianity. I'm just going to stay as a nice, gentle person and, and, and try to avoid the struggle. No, come out of the cave and get in on advancing the kingdom of God. Proclaiming his name, standing for his word. Discipling a family that is raised on his values. What does it look like to have faith in the unstoppable salvation of God in Christ? Well, it definitely looks like rejecting our own resources. Look, if you're a Christian, you just sign up for uh, believing that God is going to use you in your weakness. Not just occasionally. That's when he's going to use you. That's the logic of the cross. Greeks seek wisdom. Jews seek signs. But we preach Christ crucified. He is for us the power and the wisdom of God. And that wisdom defines us. So we have to reject our own resources right off the bat. Whether we're feeling strong or feeling weak is irrelevant. God will save by many or by few. We have to rejoice in, indulge, gaze at the champion of our faith and especially the great victory of that champion on the cross of Christ. We have to walk with him on that road towards Calvary and listen to every word and let them be precious and sweet to our souls. That's where faith will rise. And we have to advance in his victory. We have to reject the caves and the betrayals that cling us to this world and advance in the route that will be the kingdom of God when one day the kingdom of our Lord and the kingdom of Christ will be the only kingdom of this world. 
Brothers and sisters, we must anticipate God. He is a big God. His tsunami waves of glory are one day going to roll over this earth, and they roll in every time we open his word and sing his truth. Let's anticipate God. Anticipate God when we come here on Sundays. Anticipate him in your homes. Anticipate him when you're leading your children. Anticipate him in your private prayer. Anticipate him when you're reading the word. Anticipate God. God is unlimited in power and unstoppable in salvation. And he has revealed that ultimately in Jesus. And that same Jesus is available to you and to our church today. Anticipate God. Believe in the unlimited power of his unstoppable salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to take a moment right now and reject any ways that we've been trusting in ourselves or doubting you because we've looked at our own resources and any ways that we've been hanging out with the kingdom of this world. We want to start there. So as a church, Lord, we repent of any evidence of that, Lord. We just pause for a moment to do that. Let me encourage you, if that's you in any way, If you've been looking to your own resources, whether that produced doubt or confidence, repent. Turn away from looking to yourself. If there's any ways you've been hanging out with, associating with the kingdoms of this world, repent. And Lord, because your victory secured our forgiveness, Lord, We can proclaim forgiveness for self-sufficiency and worldliness immediately. There's no week of doing better that can atone for our sins. We can immediately proclaim forgiveness, Lord, because we follow you, the forgiver of sinners. And Lord, I pray now that you would cause our church to love you as the champion of our souls. Lord, cause cold hearts to flame afresh with affection for you. Lord, cause moralists and legalists to be undone by the glory of your sacrifice in their place. Lord, cause reluctant and cowering Christians to be turned into lions of the faith as they look to you. Lord Jesus, and give us faith to advance in your victory. Give us faith to do that, Lord. I pray that over our church, that you would give us faith to advance for the glory of your name, celebrating what you have done, carrying your banner. Lord Jesus, go forward. We are with you, heart and soul. Do all that you wish. If it causes us to feel weak, so be it. If it exposes us to shame, so be it. Do all that you wish. We are with you, heart and soul for your name and for the glory of your kingdom. 